All right, so welcome to the Money Wise podcast. And um, again, we've got a fantastic gentleman today in the studio. But first, just as a reminder, Money Wise Doctor is um, basically a platform for doctors and healthcare professionals where we deal with how doctors and healthcare professionals can take charge of their finances, go from mortgage to life insurance or investment, pension. They talk about side hustles, whatever it is. And every now and then, we get the opportunity to get a doctor who's out there doing amazing and fantastic things in terms of finance or business or who has some good insight in how to manage money and businesses doctors can do. So today I've got an amazing gentleman. He's taking out the time today to chat to us and I think he's got a lot of wisdom and insight. Um, so for me, it's a, it's a master class. Um, I'm just inviting you to join me to listen to Dr. Andrew Treadgold. Welcome, Andrew. Well, that's a very generous welcome. Thank you very much. Lovely. Yeah, so a little bit about Andrew. I'm going to, obviously, I'm sure he'll fill in the gaps. So Dr. Andrew Treadgold, he's actually a real doctor. Again, not like Dr. Dre. Um, he's a real <laughs> doctor. <laughs> yes. He actually went to med school sometime between the 90s and early 2000s. He went to med school. Um, I think you went to Bath, didn't you? I did. I went you to got, Bath, a proper, yeah. got a proper medical degree, so you are actually a real doctor. You're not coming into the back door or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, no dig, not digging at any particular group. Um, but also, between that time, you did your BSc. You did a BS. Well, that's physiology or, or thereabout. Yeah, and exercise then, physiology. Yep. Exercise. I was going to say sports. Then you yeah. went ahead to, I'm sure you practiced medicine for a while, being in the NHS for about 20 years so far, mm -hmm. um, maybe a bit more, that's longer than myself. <laughs> and uh, you've gone ahead to do other amazing things, apart from training as a GP and an occupational health physician. You're doing something that I don't see a lot of, a lot of doctors doing. You're a property investor, not just buy one house and flip it. You're buying houses, you're fixing them, you're flipping them. But more interestingly, you're a business buyer, you're in a quest to buy businesses. So mm -hmm. I think for um, any of our listeners, you agree with me that Dr. Andrew Treadgold is one of the interesting, fascinating doctors <laughs> that we have. All right, just a quick one. Something really fascinating has come to my notice and I wanted to share it with you. I've come to see from our YouTube analytics, from our numbers from the back end, that 75% of you who watch this channel and listen to MoneyWise Doctor are yet to hit that pressure subscribe button. Well, thank you to the 25% who have subscribed, but I just want to speak briefly to the 75% who haven't. Um, this channel has been a journey of financial empowerment for medics, healthcare professionals, and your support means everything to us. We are glad that you're on this journey with us, but it will mean the world to me if you hit the subscribe button. Um, so I'm here to ask a small favor. Subscribing to Money Wise Doctor helps us immensely. It helps us to scale up. It helps us to be able to bring in expert guests and helps us to enhance the quality of our production. And overall, this will make this a bigger and a better channel for you, providing you financial education that would help you build a stronger financial future as a medic and help you to avoid making costly financial mistakes. So if you've watched our channel before or read the blog, or if you found value in our episodes, if you like what you're watching right now, please, could you hit the subscribe button? Go ahead and smash the subscribe button. It's a simple click for you, but it makes a huge difference for us. Thank you so much for considering this. And in return, I promise to ensure that everything we do here at Money Wise Doctor not only continues, but also improves. We are committed to making each episode better, more informative, more engaging, and more empowering. So do we have a deal? hit that subscribe button and join our community of financial savvy healthcare professionals. Together, we can make the journey to financial freedom more accessible and more empowering. Okay, enough of the groveling now, enough of the groveling. Thank you for watching and remember, every click supports us in bringing more value and content to you. Let's get back to the video. Thank you. Well, you've missed it. You've missed quite a bit there, really. It's uh, it, it's a long, it's a long tale, but I'll try and I'll try and make it. Um, as as short as possible. So yeah, I went to medical school in, in London, went to Bart's, um, 
did an intercalated BSc in exercise physiology during that time, qualified from Bart's and then did my house jobs and did surgery. Uh, I was I did a, a, a full surgical training, became a urology SPR, and then something called MTAS happened, which is which was a medical training and application service. And lots of us at the time had to reapply for our own jobs, and none of us got the jobs that we were already in. Um, and so lo- lots of my colleagues that were urologists went to be trust SHOs somewhere else, even though they had training numbers. Um, I went and did general practice and then after about six months of being in general practice the whole thing collapsed and they offered us our jobs back but by that point I'd come into general practice. So then I went and did my GP stuff and I was, I've been a GP now 10 or 12, no, t- more than 12 years anyway. Um, mm. But then to cut to cut to the chase, the reason that I do what I do now is because in, in approximately 2011, I got investigated by the GMC and oh, yeah. I presume most of your audience are doctors or in health, so they, they may understand the, the ins and outs of this. So essentially what happened was it was the day before Christmas Eve, um, 2011 I think it was, or 2010, something around, it was one of those Christmases and I was in a funeral director's doing a part one for one of my patients because they'd obviously passed away. Yeah, creme form. And um, the funeral director came over and said, look, we've got this part two here. We've been waiting for the part two doctor for over a week. His phone's just switched off. The the funeral's tomorrow on Christmas Eve. Um, And, you know, can you do the part two? Because otherwise it's it's not going to go ahead. So I looked at the form and it was... I think it was a a very old person in a care home um, on end of life with cancer that passed away, you know, as an expected death. So I rang the part one doctor to ask him the questions in the creme form and the part then the the secretary said that they're in the Christmas party and not to be disturbed. So then I rang the part two doctor to ask his permission if it was all right. And his phone was went straight to answer phone, which is exactly what the funeral directors had told me. So I thought, and it's it's Christmas and it's lunchtime and I've got visits to do, and I just thought, all right, I'll do it. I'll try, you know, trying to help somebody out. So I, I did it. I said, I don't want the fee. I'm not bothered. I'm just trying to help somebody out. At the end of surgery that day, I rang the part two doctor to let him know, and he, before I could get anything out, he went absolutely mental. What are you doing? Nicking my creme forms. <laughs> this was the kind of thing that he was he was talking oh, about. So I, I, tr- I tried to calm him down and say, "Look, you know, I'm just trying to help you out. You know, give just give me a break. Do you know what I mean?" <laughs> so he said, "Oh, it's it's a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding." I said, "Right, fine, okay, whatever. I've got better things to think about." Anyway, thought nothing more of it. So that was Chris- the day before Christmas Eve. We get into mm. January, into the new year, and I get a letter through the post in January from the GMC. Um, wow. You have been accused of um, filling out cremation forms without due care, proce- due process. Um, how, you know, it's kind of how do you plead type thing. We need a meeting. Wow. Um, so I had to go and see the responsible officer and all the rest of it. Um, and ultimately, a very long story short, they investigated me for 18 months. They interviewed all my colleagues. They, they got requested all my bank statements to see how many 50 quids I was making because it was like 50 quid at the time it turns out wow. over, over a period of about two years I think I'd done I think I'd made 350 quid from creme forms so I wasn't you know I wasn't Harold Shipman do you know what I mean no. um, <laughs> and then they, they went through all my previous cremation forms that I'd ever done it was it was abs- abject misery for 18 months and during this period of time I'd lost about three stone in weight and I can imagine. I'd, I'd been a doctor for a while, you know, and um, I, I was sat actually in this in my office here, and I was looking at the walls and thinking, you know, I've been a doctor for a while. I've got a reasonable standard of living, you know. And the the MDU had, had I'd just got off the phone to the MDU, and the MDU had said to me, "You do know, Doctor Threadgold, that people can get struck off for this." And I thought what's the point if if it's your colleagues that are doing this you know what is the point what am i you know why am i putting myself through it 
It's such a fragile existence. And then the MDU said, you know, 50% of all doctors that are qualifying now will get a GMC investigation at some time. And it was so stressful. Then in the end, what happened was the, uh, the, they concluded the investigation and they wrote to me and the GMC said, look, we've got evidence that you, co- you completed a cremation form without due process because you've admitted it. I said, yeah, I did admit it. Yeah, because I did it. Um, so you've got two choices. You can either accept a warning that will be on your GMC register for the next five years that will detail the fact that you've done, you've been dishonest, basically, because you signed a form and it says, have you asked these, have you asked the part one doctor? And I hadn't. So you can either accept that or you can go to a full MTPS tribunal. Um, yeah, we know, know what that is. Yeah, and the two outcomes from MTPS tribunal are one, erasure, or two, nothing. Which one do you want to go down? And, af- and after 18 months, of stress and all the rest of it, I took the warning. I couldn't face it. I was in such a terrible place that I just couldn't do I mean, it. I mean, the impact, I can't even imagine the impact on your mental health, just sort of your life and your career, your whole life career, you what hanging in the balance. Mm. Um, sounds reasonable to want to end it all as quickly as possible. Yeah, but you get into some very dark places, you know. It's... Um, yeah. It's incredibly stressful for anybody that's been out there and been investigated by the GMC. It's absolutely harrowing because it nothing happens quickly. They set a deadline for a reply to something and then the review for that deadline and the information provided is another three months down the line and you're practicing day to day worrying about making a mistake. So you constantly, it's defensive practice all the time because the last thing you need is another complaint when you've got this GMC thing going on. The last thing you, so so your practice is impaired even whilst it's going on because they drag it out for so long. And it's no wonder people, you know, kill themselves when the GMC are investigating them because it's absolutely horrible. It sounds very harrowing, Andrew. I mean, I've, I've not been through GMC. Well, I don't know, there's still time. I've not been to gyms, but I've had a lot of friends and, um, well, not friends, but I've had colleagues, basically, who have had investigations. Mm. And I've been sort of followed their story and I've gone on the MTPS. And it sounds really, really very harrowing. It sounds like the experience no doctor wants to think about, especially if you think about the amount of time you've invested into getting to where you are yeah. and the fact that there are no options for where to go from there. Um, But what can I say? It seems that out out of that difficult experience, out of that really, really darkness came some light and (laughs) led you down the pathway where you are now. So tell us a bit about that. Well, that's exactly it. That's exactly right. So I think I, I, I always say that the vast majority of people in jobs and any job, medicine in particular, because they pay you just enough to keep you comfortable, but not enough to kind of give you freedom yeah um so i was firmly in the comfort zone you know i had consumer debt i had you know credit cards and i had cars on finance and all the stuff that when you've got a nice income all the stuff that you're putting into your lifestyle i was no different to anybody else um but this really narrowed my focus and it moved me out it's like having a three-lane motorway in the middle you've got the comfort zone at one end you've yeah. got pain and at the other end you've got you know something else so I, I moved out of the comfort zone into a very painful place and that is what made me decide that actually I'd fallen out of love with medicine because if your colleagues are the ones that can get you into the GMC you know it's not the it's not the holes in the road that you no. know, the potholes that you can see coming like patient problems it's actually people yeah. stabbing you in the back um, your, just, your co-passengers maybe yeah exactly and it, I just thought we're supposed to be in this together so during yeah. that whole period of time there was a lot of reflection going on um, part of it demanded by the GMC actually that you, one of the things that they made me do is reflect heavily on you know the cremation act and my part in this process <laughs> and all the rest of it they really try and, oh. <laughs> and, and make you suffer um, there's not a lot to reflect on, on cremation apart from I don't well, I'm, you uh, must have built up a lot of things that, that you yeah. wouldn't need in the future. Yeah, I did. I think I did. I think I did a. It was a six thousand word essay on the, the Cremation Act Ooh. following the Shipman Inquiry. 
um, that I presented oh to you. Oh my god! But yeah, they they, do, they make you do all sorts of things. But that whole painful process deconstructed what I what I knew and what I thought about life and the way life works. And I went from being slowly, it was a very slow process, and I'm, I'm still developing now, you know, 13 yeah. years later, whatever. Um, yeah. But I went from having a consumerism mindset where I would pay for things with on, on credit to enjoy them today, and I changed that into a longer-term lifestyle where I now buy assets that then... Yes provide an income and I use that income from the assets to pay for stuff to fund your life to fund yeah. my life this is and this is this is sort of the ethos of money wise doctor that's come basically that sort of thinking is where we're trying to get doctors to go um so it seems this GMC investigation got you to the point where you made a radical transformation in terms of your not just your financial thinking, but mm. generally in terms of your, your your life philosophy, you went from just, I'm going to get money, pay my debt, I'm going to get money, pay for my car, pay for my house. Um, you got to the point where you started thinking about sustainable, you know, passive income generation. Well, some people say there's no passive income, but you started thinking about how to get alternative income sources mm-hmm. other than being fully dependent on your income as a doctor and um, my thinking is that if that hadn't happened well i don't really know if you might have gotten yourself in this direction where you are now where you're mm-hmm. buying properties you're buying businesses no. which is not something i can say many doctors do. no I, it would never have happened i would never have done it um and i mean my first port of call was um my first exit from medicine was going to be stocks and shares. So I did some training and I did, a, I think I did a diploma from the Institute of Portfolio Management. And I ran my own long, short, hedged portfolio for, for a while. And the point of that was that I was going to prove my track record through my portfolio and then apply for jobs in hedge funds. Um, and I did all right at it. I learned an awful lot about stocks and shares. Um, and how professional traders actually trade and not amateur traders, like retail traders. Um, But the trouble with that was it was still a single source of income and it was still exchanging time for money. And then uh, long, long story short, and many, many books that I read later, we ended up in doing some property and we started off with a, a very small terraced house in a town near here called Darlington. Um, I think I bought it for forty-seven thousand. Spent about fifteen thousand on it, and it well, how long? Ago, how long ago was that? It's getting on for four or five, five ish, five oh, yeah. years ish, something like that. I live in I live in the southwest. Um, I, I know whenever I come up to the north, is Darlington, Newcastle, Durham, you know, Yam. I think yeah. really this beautiful houses are for sale at this price. But, yeah. but then real estate is very local um before before we delve into your real estate experience i want to go back to your experience in the capital markets because uh-huh. i i've been I, yeah i've been in stock markets since i was a teenager and, and it's an interesting area for me i've never really run a fund it's always been all the private family office type of stuff um what was the experience when you were sort of like managing a fund did you have investors outside investors what sort of portfolio where you manage it in terms of AUM, that's the assets under management, and uh, what was sort of like the type of things you invested in mainly? Yeah, so it was, well, to start with, you have to start with your own money because, you know, with no experience, who's going to, you know, who's going to give you a job? So it was entirely my own money. I took a loan out to invest in the stock market. Um, and I was, uh, do, do you know about long and short pairs? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's more like you're trying to trade, um, you're trying to short the market uh, at the same time, or you're shorting particular stocks, and at the same time, you're buying some long. Um, so you're trying to buy. So basically, if you buy a stock in the stock market, any stock at all, and you're holding it, you're long on the stock. But sometimes we do something called shorting, which I did a lot in crypto, but never really got the balls to do it in the stock market. In right. crypto, whenever I saw um, crypto during the 2001 crypto boom, I was a new, fairly new GP, and I, I took out six weeks just to find any crypto I thought was worthless, and people were excited about it. I short sold it a lot, 
and then you know shouting is like just i know andrew you know what this is let me just yeah. for the audience just as i come to andrew i say i really like your your microphone um can you lend it to me and um i'll give it back to you in six months and then at that point maybe the microphone is very popular somebody has actually popularized on youtube and it's very inflated in price maybe selling for a thousand pounds and i take it from andrew and i sell it immediately and i i bank a thousand pounds and then i come back six months later nobody's talking about the microphone again is now back to the original price or even a bit lower maybe 300 pounds i go then and buy back this microphone and give it to andrew and then i profit 700 obviously you have to think about things like the fees and other things did i did i do justice to it Shorten. yeah yeah absolutely and basically the the the, the simple the, the simple way is that if if you are if you are short amazon and Amazon's share price goes down, you make money. If you are long Amazon and Amazon's share price goes down, you lose money. And you can do that with any stock. So the principle behind hedge funds and long short hedged portfolios, which is what I run, um, of my own rather, is that you you find, the, the, the simplest example is you find two sec, two, two, um, a pair of securities yeah you find two securities in the same sector yeah so you might you might be uh, long apple and short samsung for example and yeah. you are expecting that one of them will do better than the other so you might have slightly more apple than you've got samsung because you think apple will outperform samsung over a long period of time now what happens is if the market moves up and apple raises in value and Samsung follows it because the the index moves and every stock moves with it it's like a boat on a on a on a sea so yes. rising tide floats Swim all boats out. yeah rising tide yeah. floats all boats so if if apple goes up samsung's likely to go up as well but over a long yes. time horizon you tend to find that there are certain events that happen within the eco economics of the world that will make one perform differently um, so Apple might be releasing a new phone and that might be the catalyst to make Apple go, go, go even further. So what you're trying to do is if the market rises, Apple and Samsung rise, you make money on Apple and you lose money on Samsung. And what you're trying to do is create the margin between the two. And that margin is where you make your money. So the yes. vast majority of retail traders over a period of 20 years that are interested in the stock market might select a handful of stocks. They might like the sound of Apple. They might like Google. <laughs> they, they might like, I don't know, General Electric. They might, they, yeah. they might, there might be quite a few stocks that they like and they'll put money into each one of them. But essentially, yes. they are long all of them. And over yeah, a period of time, they end up with so many that they're essentially long the index because they're so yes. diversified across everything. Now, it only takes... Absolutely. A year like 2000 and I don't know 2008 2009 or more recently 2018 where there was a 20, big correction. 20, that was 2020 as well. Could be yeah. 2020. Yeah, yeah, there was. Yeah, but where there's a where there's a massive correction, and then everything that you're long loses value. Whereas if you had pairs that were shorting the, the similar stock, you would you wouldn't have lost your value because the shorts would have made money when the market corrected. So it's it's that's what that's called hedging, and that's what hedge funds are all about. Exactly. Yeah, Andrew, thank you for that. I'll say that as a, a mini masterclass on long shot hedge funds. Um, basically, um, because I've been trading for well, not trading. I I take positions for a long time. I never hold more than maybe six or seven. Um, but in mono, at monowhitedoctor.com, we tend to heavily suggest that doctors. Obviously, you, you are doing it fully and you were studying you knew what you were doing but then so that doctors if they don't have the time to understand how to pick stocks or or short the market or short particular stocks to buy an index fund yeah. that's basically what you're doing that you're spreading out the risk over several stocks and then you might still obviously the value of your investment might go down but then if you hold on over a long period of time you will slowly and surely get there 
Um, it's just I didn't start with index fund. I'm used to doing an analysis and taking a position and all that. So example is 2020, where there were so many bargains in the market. So mm-hmm. someone who was in a position to you know, take advantage of it. That was really a very good time. Um, yeah, but that, that was very interesting. Um, you've actually gone into Wall Street, if I might say. Well, not the US <laughs> Wall Street, but that, what, what, what is it for UK? What is the equivalent of Wall Street? Should we say it's um, well, it's Canary a square Wall. mile in the city. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, the city. It's, yeah. Um, well, it's so difficult to do it properly, you know. I, there's a lot, an awful lot of time that has to go into researching things. And the, the leading indicators uh, are, are the absolute fundamentals of doing it. And then on top of knowing what the leading indicators are, then you've got to figure out what the forex positions of those businesses is and how that will be affected by whatever leading indicators are telling you and then you've got to, you know then you've got to look for a catalyst because you need a catalyst to turn a stock that's performing at a certain level and make it rise above its target or, or its predicted predicted level um, so there's an awful lot of time and effort spent in it so all these people that can pick stocks it is just even if you think you're reading the the financial reports from the business you're still gambling because there's so much more to it before you can actually pick a stock. You've got to have a much wider breadth of information because everything else is gambling. So if you if you don't have the knowledge, time, and expertise to do it properly, buy an ETF or buy a you know buy some Vanguard fund and just leave it and let somebody else do take the risk because they get paid very handsomely for doing it. Or buy property. Or buy property. <laughs> Before we jump into property, I just said this about uh, just so that we can wrap up stocks. Even though I suspect we might end up spending an hour to talking about it because I have lived and dreamed the stock market for a while in different countries. Now, um, a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, there are people like Warren Buffett and they beat the market and they talk about index funds and you know they." But, but I looked at the data and we did an article on it on MoneyWise.com. That 99% of professional money managers don't speed the markets. Part of it is not because they're not brilliant, they're bright, and they're dedicating their life to doing all this. But when you add on the fees, and when you add on some some of the losses they make because of human errors over the long time, they tend to lose. And when people say, "Oh yeah, there are people that can beat the market," uh, your example of what you were doing. It's really very good because it gives somebody who is sitting behind the desk. I have a friend who is a cardiologist in the northeast, not so far from where you are, and they decided to take out some time to go through a course from an internet guru who was um, a trader and who probably made more money selling the course. Mm-hmm. And I, I tried to explain to them, and I, I'm glad they eventually came to understand that after losing a bit of money. That really what you're doing is that you're trying to play tennis. And I think an author used this analogy. Yeah, you're playing tennis with someone on the other side. You don't know who is who you're playing with. And you think, well, I'm just going to play this tennis because I I, I took some lessons, I know how to play. But you don't know you're playing against the Williams sisters. <laughs> yeah, on the other side. You can't see them. So they have information you don't have, they have training you don't have. Like what you were doing, the amount I can't even imagine the amount of research you must have put in and even at that even when you read the 10k there's so many things you don't see this is why people have teams hedge funds have teams and have yeah. analysts and researchers so for those looking to invest in the stock market if you're not ready to do the work most people are not ready or don't have the time especially if you're a doctor maybe just buy an index fund yeah. and uh, that way you just be average yeah right? And and avoid leverage. Straight. Avoid leverage. And the other thing I would avoid say, leverage. I would pick up on something you said there about Warren Buffett, because there's, a, there's yeah. Warren Buffett's got a big, like a cult following, and if Warren <laughs> Buffett buys or sells something, every or mentions a stock, everybody travels to it. But Warren Buffett doesn't pick stocks. Oh, he, no. Warren, Warren buys Buffett, companies. Yeah, Warren Buffett's method of investing is influence investing. So he's got the backing to go buy a significant proportion of a company with the management team, change the management team, and influence the performance of that company so that its stock price rises. He's not picking a stock on the stock market. So a completely different way to invest. So you can't, people can't follow Warren's advice. 
unless you've got billions to influence company management and performance. So that, that's a whole nother topic that I don't want to get I'm into. I'm glad. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because a lot of time people think, oh, you know, it's just like being a, a neurosurgeon and someone thinks, well, I've looked on the TV, I see what neurosurgeons do. I'm just going to go in there and get out that uh, tumor from that brain. I'm like, no, no, yeah. no, no, you no, can't really do that. But I agree with you. Uh, actually, I'm going to be in Omaha, hopefully later this year, in Warren Buffett's. Uh, hopefully, I should meet him because Charlie Munger has died now. Yeah. Sad, but yeah. His yeah. So I'm going to be in Omaha for the shareholders meeting. Are you? Who knows? I'm a, yeah. Wow. I mean, time the year. Yeah. So maybe I might be in the same room and breathe the same air. It's yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, one of, I'm one of I'm one of them, but I don't delude myself in any way, shape, or form that I'm going to do what Warren Buffett does. Because apart from being an investment genius, he's had so many years of buying businesses, because that's what he does, isn't it? He's buying businesses. I know buying stuff is like buying businesses, but most people are looking at it like just sort of like picking up stuff and all that. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you so much. So this is like two different, rather so far, we've already unpacked just two layers and we haven't <laughs> actually gotten to the main dish. So if you're still watching, <laughs> stick around, because Andrew, in addition to having been a urologist, and I didn't even know that bit, that you actually fully trained as a urologist, then worked as a GP, and this investigation of GMC got you down the path of trying to expand your source of income. You've also actually managed funds, sort of like being in the stock market for real, for real. But in addition to all of that, you have very hands-on experience in managing properties, buying property projects. I, well, we're all on LinkedIn together. I follow you and I see the pictures you share. You're not like every, you know, some people on LinkedIn say what they do, but you're showing what you do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm originally from Nigeria. There's a saying in Nigeria, a Nigerian pigeon that says, you go explain tire, no evidence. It says, <laughs> without evidence, you're going to have too many words for your life. I think you're, you got the meaning of it. So you're showing <laughs> evidence. So, <laughs> without any evidence, you're just going to say, oh, I'm this, I'm that. I'm, who really yeah. cares? Yeah. But you're doing a lot of work in property, which I suspect is sort of the base you're building to throw off cash flow to then try to buy a business. Um, could you tell us a bit about that journey? How did you get into that aspect? Why did you get into that aspect? I mean, apart, was that from your hedge fund days that you decided I'm going to go into property or? Yeah, it was, um, like I said, the, 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 the kind of stock market thing and wanting to go and, and get a job in a hedge fund. I realized that it was a job and it's just another single source of income whilst the bonuses can be they're not what they were but they can still be huge um it it was always going to be working for somebody else and I've been as a partner in a practice you, you kind of you're self-employed aren't you so I think I've been so self-employed long enough to make <laughs> make me unemployable nowadays um yeah <laughs> so, so I, I i looked at alternatives and um i can't remember exactly how it came about but property has always been something in the background everybody's got an opinion on property um everybody loves it even if they're not not doing property shall we say and i just thought i'd i'd have a go and i'd i'd see if if it worked and i, I got I got educated. I read a lot of books, and and I, like I started with one very small property in Darlington, um, bought it cheap, put some money into it, valued up to the point where I could put a mortgage on it and pull most, pretty much all of my money back out, and then it rented out nicely. And I thought, well, this works. You know, I've got still got my money, and now I've got a house, um, and I've got someone giving me an income. But it was, I think, the the when you take the mortgage costs off the rent. I think I was left with about 250, 300 quid a month. Um, that's not bad. That's not bad for buy to let. But I thought, bear in mind, I was desperate to give myself an exit from medicine if needed because of what had happened. And I thought, quick, I'm going to need an awful lot of buy to lets to replace my income. So we toddled along. And then the next thing you know, we, um, we thought, well, we'll I knew from one of the practices I was a partner at at the time that there was a lot of work coming to the area and it was a 40 or 50 year plan to regenerate this part of the northeast and I, I knew this before it had kind of become public knowledge um, so we started buying properties to make them into 
um, we call it serviced accommodation. People might know it yes. as Airbnb. Airbnb, um, yeah. Which is not, Airbnb is just just a brand. It's a bit like saying a Hoover yeah. instead of a vacuum. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> and it, it, it's the bane of people's lives because Airbnb are sucking their money out of the market left, right, and centre. But that's a different story. Um, <laughs> so we do it's we do service like, accommodation. It's a, like, it's a bit like Uber and YouTube yeah, and exactly. all the they, platform that don't produce anything, but they aggregate producers and then make money from them. Yeah, and they, they take so much in commission. I mean. Uh, they, yeah. they take they take between twenty and twenty five percent off your top line, oh, from your wow. turnover. Uh, so it's That's worse than having a franchise, which usually takes. That's 10%. a lot. Sorry, twenty twenty five percent of your turnover, not the profit, the turnover. Correct. They take twenty yeah. percent of it. Yeah. That is massive. How do they expect you to actually survive in the business? Yeah, it doesn't exactly. make any sense to me. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very difficult. So. The trick to the service accommodation game is that you use Airbnb and Booking.com as your marketing platforms because they have such big reach. Um, and you get, and in our area, we have so many workers that are coming to the area and they're here for months and months and months on end. So we try and get them first through Airbnb or Booking.com and then we contact them once they're in and then we convert them to direct bookings. And then we've got a 20% margin to play with. So we can give them a discount of 10% and we're still making 10% more. So That's very yeah. smart. Yeah. That's very and smart. That, that's what I would do. <laughs> yeah, it's easier said than done, but that's the trick. <laughs> it's harder, but you think about it. If I went to an area and I stayed in a place and I've had people offer me, yeah, if you come back, we're going to give you this discount. I tend to, would prefer to contact directly if there's mm. a place because then it's easier to just deal that with the person. But it's not the same for every traveler and it depends on how often the person is coming to that area. Yeah. yeah. So you went into service accommodation. After that, your first property, you bought it for 47000 You invested about 15000 isn't it, to yeah. refurbish it. And you were making an extra 200 quid, which obviously is not enough to replace your income. Mm -hmm. Might be a nice margin between the mortgage, but you were a GP partner, so you definitely had a bit more income coming in. So you mm -hmm. decided you were going to go into service accommodation. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so how many of those service accommodation do you currently run? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I like um, that you're thinking about it. So it's so many. Yeah, it's, we, we've, well, I mean, I can, it's easier for, to, for, you, for me to tell you that we, we bought five in December alone and we're currently we've got 30, 29 that we're purchasing in Q1 of 2024. Wow. And in that, that, is in, quite that in that 29 is a 26 bedroom hotel. Um, that wow. that's not included. The twenty nine <laughs> the hotel is just one of them. Um, so yeah, it, but it, but this is so we are currently just on the on the uptick on the the hockey stick curve. We're just about to set off because it's the way that we've traditionally done it is we use a lot of creative finance. So we don't necessarily. So I, for example give you a good example the first property we bought after the terraced house in darlington was two flats it was a block of flats two flats on one title um and it wasn't selling but all my money was tied up in the in the um in the terraced house in darlington because it, we hadn't put the mortgage on it yet but i saw this opportunity and i really wanted it so i went to the guy selling it and it was on the market for, I think it was 110 grand, 115 or something. All right, 22, um, slot, 22 block of flats. So. Yeah, and I, I said to him, look, you know, this place isn't selling. It's only investors that are going to want it because who wants to buy two flats in one? Um, and it's been on the market for six months. I've been watching it. But, I, you know, I would, I would really like to talk to you about it. So he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, look, why don't we... Why don't we say I think I said 60 grand to start with because they need a lot of work so there's a lot of money needs to be spent on them anyway backwards and forwards and we settled at 75,000 um, and I said right okay that's great we'll, we'll do 75 grand but my money's tied up so can we exchange contracts now so that you know it's sold and then I will agree 
well, I'll give you five grand deposit if we exchange contracts now. So I've got I've secured this deal, and then I will give you the other seventy thousand in twelve to eighteen months once I've been into the property and renovated it. Good. Yeah. And then I can get a mortgage at the higher value, and I'll give you your seventy grand back. And he said, I "Yeah, I love that." So that, that's called exchange with delay completion. So most people will know when they buy a house, you exchange contracts and you complete usually on the same day, but there's a space between them and that space can be as long as you want. So I often use exchange and delayed completion so that I then get time to get, them, get my money back in from whatever project it's in, do the work, increase the value of the property and then refinance out at the other end and pay the guy or the girl. That is creative. That is yeah. that is very creative. I, I, I'm not I'm not surprised. You're buying in the business of buying businesses now, and uh, I'd imagine you'd be coming up with all sorts of creative finance. One of one of the analogies you give in your one of your podcasts. So Andrew has a podcast for those listening. He has a very interesting podcast, Property Doctor podcast. Mm -hmm. One thing he talked about was the days in the 80s when you showed up in a Rolls Royce and wrote a golden check that's right when I was saying that to buy a business those days are gone I thought you were going to say the days in the 80s when you showed up in a Rolls Royce with a bag of money <laughs> yeah yeah so so that is really a brilliant way because most times when people think about stuff think how did he make money to buy that how did he do that but a lot of times you were doing the mental work, you were doing the educational work, you were learning how to do it. I don't imagine you learned any of that in bad, so you medical no. <laughs> How did you how did you start doing all that sort of like really is that fancy actually? Because lots of people in property do it. Property lends itself to creative finance and modern stock market or anything else yeah. so how did you get to that point what did you attend some courses were you mingling with people doing stuff like that how did you get to that point we'll get back to the property journey but i want to know how did you get to that learning how to think like that because certainly uh, I, wasn't positive. i read a lot of books uh, i read between 40 and 50 books a year still um on all sorts of topics usually property or business or um, it, actually, at the minute, I'm, I've just finished today. I've just finished Richard Branson's Losing My Virginity, and he, he right. does a, <laughs> an classic. awful lot. Yeah, he, he does an awful lot about debt. He starts off needing three hundred grand overdraft, then three million, then three hundred million overdraft, and it's just it's just numbers. You know, the debt is so important, and that and having good and that's the that classic book, Rich Dad Poor Dad: The Difference Between Good Debt and Bad Debt is so important. My life was full of bad debt, and now it's yeah. full of good debt. You know, I've got more yeah. debt now than I've ever had, but it, yeah. it pays me to have it, so. But you're yeah. not awake at night thinking about the debt because it's positive cash flow. It's exactly. just like, um, I've got I've got tenants. Who, well, I've got, I, I owe money to the bank for a mortgage, but my tenants pay. They pay for, obviously, when they pay the rent, it covers for the debt, so I yeah. understand where you're coming from got deep depth and it seems you're trying to do the same thing now you're trying to buy business but you're looking for creative financing um which i i try to think andrew that is um a less risky way to do business i think is less risky to try to finance things creatively the way that you don't have to put up money up front for instance if you were um, buying a business and you took over first of all you actually put in a lot of resources and you put in some time you put up creativity to get the business to generate some if not all the money you used to buy the property sh mm. sh will you shed some light on that on your process so i mean first of all the, the no money down business buying is really rare um as I'm finding, so at the minute I've got I've got one business that I've got the share purchase agreement done, the deal is done, the lawyers are doing their thing, and then that we should complete on that business in March, and that that business is a heavy goods vehicle MOT and service centre. Um, the rough numbers for you, it turns about one and a half million, does about two hundred fifty to three hundred grand net net cash profit um it's on a site and the site is worth about 600 grand um the owner's had a health scare needs to needs wants to travel the world with his new partner so 
bottom line with that this deal is, is I'm buying the site at whatever it's valued at, which is likely to be six hundred thousand. Um, and then so that he gets six hundred grand up front on day one from the per- from me purchasing the site. And then I'll give him another hundred grand, which will come from wherever it comes from, probably from assets the the business owns. Um, and then so he'll get seven hundred grand on day one, and then he'll get a further four hundred thousand pounds over a period of years as like a pension. Wow. And that wow. four hundred grand wow. will essentially be paid out of the business's profits because it can more than wow. afford to pay it. Um, so that's that deal, and I've got another. I've well, got another well, well is... sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Andrew. We're not going to gloss over that. Congratulations! <laughs> no, it's not. It's not over the line yet, but it's nearly. Yeah, we're almost there. I mean, for someone who's listening, if you're listening, you don't understand what goes into buying a property. I know you did call at least over three thousand business sellers before you got to the point. Where oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Wow, Lots because sellers. what you described to me seems like. Um, a fantastic deal um but I'd, I'd imagine you actually have put in a lot of work you're talking about 1.5 million turnover, about 20 percent basically it's roughly 20 percent net profit and you've got the added assets on the ground which is the 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 property there which you're paying 600 for but we know you're going to increase the value because you've been in real estate you know how to increase value mm-hmm. and you can all that you can add other ancillary businesses or whatever to it yeah, exactly. so massive congratulations to to you. And I, I'm I'm not going to we're not going to gloss over it. It's a big win, and I hope you get obviously to the end of completion in March, and you find more businesses. Right, let's carry on. Yeah, and the next one is I've got a physiotherapy company. The 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 deal is agreed. I should be going down there next week to sign the heads of terms, and then get the legals going on that. Um. So yeah, so and then there's another kind of occupational therapy company that we've kind of verbally agreed things, um, but it's difficult to finance that because it's so so hard to raise money against a company where its assets, whilst it might have a lot of assets, the commodes or their wheelchairs or and and, peop- and, and banks don't really like lending against things no. like commodes because they, they, they can, don't understand it exactly that. <laughs> Um, whereas with a with a HGV site, you know they can lend against the property, or they can lend against the brake rollers that they use to test the trucks and stuff. So it's a difficult one, the HGV one. But um, but yeah. So the point there is that I will be using some of my own money in that business purchase because in order to put the deposit down to buy the site, that will need to be my money. And if if it wasn't for that, and if I didn't have the access to funds, either through my investors or through my own money, through my property business, then it, it would, that deal wouldn't be able to happen. So the property is key. Being able to acquire the property is is the key to unlocking a lot of business purchases like this. That is that is brilliant. I I love what I'm hearing, Andrew. I wouldn't be surprised. We'll have more podcasts to unpack some of this because we're. We've got so much packed into this one podcast, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's really brilliant. I'm thinking about it um, from the point of um, just your mentality around it. You are an occupational physician, um, but you're not thinking about it from I'm going to buy a job that I can run because that's what some people buy. They buy a job. Yeah. They're trying to buy stuff that can run without you. I don't imagine you're going to train to become a head GV driver. I'm not no. saying you can do it. Yeah. But basically, well, that, what, 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 what? Yeah, carry on. No, I mean, that's very important because I, I, I don't want to run this business. I, I, I want to grow it. And the, the, the grand plan is that I want to buy similar or ancillary businesses and put them into a group and build the group. And that's, that's the grand plan. Now, in order to buy businesses that you don't have to be there every day, they've got to be a certain size. So my criteria for the businesses that I look at, that they've got to be over 10 years old because that shows that they're resilient. They've got to have a, a, a turnover of over a million quid because any less than that, and you tend to find that they haven't got a, a level of management. So by the time you get a business to a size where it's, it's turning over a million quid or it's making a million pounds in sales, there's got to be a lot of managers that can manage that 
and then there's staff underneath it that you know because you don't get to that size without being able to manage it so the million pound turnover threshold is important um, and then it's got to be profitable because I don't want to buy a, a distressed business there's enough of those <laughs> nah. for, so nah. so those are my main my main things in terms of the sectors I'm not so I'm, I really didn't want to get into health I really wanted All to right. avoid okay. health because I've had enough yeah. of health like, but, like uh, me. <laughs> yeah. So you, this, you're a bit sector is... agnostic. You don't mind any sector you have. It's Correct. Yeah. It, if there's an opportunity, yeah. I'll, I'll have a look yeah. at it because ultimately these businesses are streams of income and it's all about multiple streams of income. And in the end, if mm -hmm. I can grow it, which I'm sure I can because I've been involved in other people's businesses and all the rest of it. And I've been involved in business purchases and sales before I, I started doing my own. Um, then, you know, if I can grow it, all the better. But it's um, it's just an exciting journey. And what what else would I be doing? But I tell you what, it beats oh. it beats anti Maureen's corn. So I can assure you. <laughs> I love it. It's fascinating. I mean, just the amount of learning. You know, the the kind of person it has taken to go from being a JP, an occupational health physician, to a person who introduces themselves as business buyer. Right, yeah. You know, your, your LinkedIn says business buyer, property investor, and then doctor. So I can't imagine the amount of transformation it takes from the mental point of view, from emotional point of view, understanding that, oh, it's 3,000 3, debts and 3 million debts. It's just some extra zeros, but depends on what you know you're doing in between to increase value. Um, beyond the books you read, because I know you read, you read quite a few of them and recently I listed some books on my LinkedIn. I saw you had read almost all of them. <laughs> I, do, I do quite a few a year myself, maybe not as many as you. Um, but beyond the books you read, was there like, did you have a coach or did you have like a mastermind? Did you attend some workshops? Because there's just, I don't feel myself that I would have the confidence to, um, there are things I've done, I've started businesses, I just studied online, I came up with an idea and I launched them. For the dimension you are operating on, I don't feel quite confident that I could approach someone to say, sell me your business. And then I'll be wondering if I'm going to give them to a, a deal that is too good. And then I'm going to end up with you know, something that's not that great. So how do they approach this? I mean, the education aspect of it. Well, there's a couple of facets to that. So what, what you're hearing now, whilst it might sound clever and glor you know, glamorous or whatever, it, it, this is the culmination. This is the culmination of 2011 to 2024. That period of time is is the learning and the compound effect of networking very regularly, reading very regularly, a, investing in a coach. You know, I I have a coach for property. I have a property coach, and I have a business acquisition coach, and they both they both get paid very well for coaching me. Um, but it's the shortest way to achieving an outcome. But the, the confidence doesn't come from them. They just help to guide and say, yeah, that's all right. Or maybe if you did that a bit differently, or, you know, this is how you find leads or whatever. The actual confidence comes from those years practicing and showing up every day and doing what I say I'm going to do and proving to myself that I can do it. Because if I say to someone, I'm going to buy this property, and then all of a sudden, my pipeline of properties, because we do about, at the minute, we've got four big development sites on the go. Each one's about 150 grand refurb. So if one of those overruns, then my funds are delayed to buy the next property. So then, but I've promised that person that I'll I'll buy it. So what do I do? So whatever I do to, to buy so it. To, money. Well, yeah. no, to buy it's the most important thing because I've promised the person that I'll buy it. So whatever I have to do yeah. to do that, then... When I achieve it, I've proven to myself I can do it and it gives you more confidence. And Absolutely. slowly but surely, over the years, you develop an inner belief that, you know, I've done all sorts of deals in all sorts of ways now, but mm. I can do I can do this in business. It's very, very similar. You know, there's, there's, right. there's a lot of similarities in the way that you do it. Um, but education is important. Back when I, you know, back when I went to Bart's, I looked at a flat in Whitechapel that was £111,000 
a two bed flat okay. in Whitechapel and my dad yeah. refused to lend me half of the deposit because I was going halves with a friend and that flat's Ooh. now nearly a million quid uh, but back then oh. in those <laughs> days there were things like um, same day remortgages so you could buy them cheap and then refinance them the same day pull your money out that yes. day and I didn't know yes. that and no, that was before the global financial yeah, crisis yeah exactly when, when and that knowledge that knowledge yeah. was held by a few it wasn't held by the many and it wasn't as a, as easily accessible as it is now so now anything you need to know about property is out there for free on the internet if you know where to look um, or there's some good coaches and as I move towards the my exit from medicine which isn't very long away I can tell you that it's I'm, I'm now thinking of doing some business or personal development coaching for other people that are wanting to follow a similar path but don't expect to get financial freedom in seven days it's taking me no. years <laughs> but, there we go seven, so my my, my goal when, when i was when i was 42 i set a goal to be out of medicine by the time i'm 55 i'm 46 okay. and i'll be i am okay. leaving this year i'm retiring this year from medicine wow congratulations so you beat you beat your target actually by several years you're only 46 i think you've done really quite well andrew it done really, really well. If I might put it in mild terms, <laughs> I mean, apart from apart from the journey, I mean, four years from 20, 2000 roughly, it was that twenty eleven when you had the GMC investigation, when you started your journey, and most people tend to underestimate the amount of time it takes to do stuff. I think the last thirteen years, if you've invested thirteen years in the, in your journey, it seems a bit short to me. I'll say. Right. But someone else, they're thinking, they're thinking about it from the point of, oh, I want to get financially free. And maybe they look at what you're doing, maybe they see what I've done, and, and they think, oh, yeah, I want to. And I'm saying, no, I didn't start investing in the stock market or learning how to do stuff and money stuff when I was med, when I was a doctor. I started when I was in med school. Before then, I was running centers and all that. So if you've managed to do all this and transition in 13 years, I think the hard work is quite well worth it because mm -hmm. most people wouldn't do what you do because of the time and the effort that goes into it. But I tend to look at it from the alternative point is to continue practicing till I'm 68, because NHS pension, which I'm no longer part of, but you're continuing practicing. If you're a salary doctor or self-employed, you continue practicing till you're 68 and then you get um, pension, which is nice, but you know, we're talking about the risk aspect of it. Your mm -hmm. source of income could be threatened by someone who could accuse you falsely you could have an you could have a bad day make a mistake as a doctor mm -hmm. and things can always go wrong i mean parkinson's law if something can go wrong it can always go wrong so <laughs> you invest in that time <laughs> to diversify your income i think it's super impressive and the, the amount of time you've invested in education coaching obviously you still had the gods to do what you did, and you're just a brilliant person. To, well, no, it, it wasn't that. It was I didn't have a choice. I didn't feel like I had a choice. That was the. That's point. what a brilliant person would say. They would say they didn't have a choice. They just learned what they had to learn. But I agree with you. Um, tell me a bit about your coaching. You, you're look, you're moving towards because you're from your. You're not like an average YouTuber. Someone running around telling people, "Oh, I'll show you how to do this." You've actually <laughs> lived the journey. So what, what sort of coaching program are you looking to do? Or have you got it up and running? Have you got people? Yeah. Because I, I've got people listening now who might be interested. Right, okay. Well, it wasn't a pitch. I haven't even thought about it. It was just something that came out of my mouth. But it, one of the things that I, I'm thinking about is, you know, some sort of kind of career coaching or, or mindset coaching for, for people that are, are I, I mean, I could coach about property, I could coach about business acquisition, I could coach about medical careers, people that are going through a difficult time and help them through the GMC investigations, all that stuff. Um, but ultimately, I'm not a property guru, I'm just little old me that's showing up every day and trying to do what I do. I'm not a business buying guru, I'm just little old me having a go. Because what's the worst that can happen? Somebody will say no and I'll try somebody else, you know? Um, so, but the the... The, the mental strength, there's a switch there. And I, by the, when, when I ended with the GMC, I was mentally broken. And I'd had a traumatic episode in my personal life as well, and I was a shadow of a person. And to get to the point now where I've 
got the confidence, as you say, to go and speak to these people. At some point along the journey, there is a mental, like a mindset shift. And you move away from the kind of scarcity mindset that drives everybody that you've got to save every penny and not risk anything because you might never see that money again and all the rest of it. You've moved from that to an abundance mindset where you can see that there's money everywhere. You know, the the Bank of England said in one of the base rate announcements that there was three hundred and fifty billion pounds in people's zero interest current accounts in the UK. And then if you look into the savings, there's in the trillions of pounds. So there is money literally everywhere. So why are we so why are we so damn protective over it? And I've found that as I'm more more generous and I'm um, more out there that, that there is an abundance of anything there's an abundance of opportunity and that mindset shift comes and it takes either well it takes coaching really to get that that switch and maybe that's where my coaching will lie I don't know but if somebody needs any help yeah feel free to get in touch and we'll see what we can do <laughs> uh, if you look at the show notes we're going to put the link to Andrew's um, website and his podcast he he, he does really fantastic really very helpful stuff and he's very sincere i think that might be andrew's brand is andrew's brand like <laughs> i'm going to open the curtain and i'll show you what's happening in my life i'm not claiming to be anything i'm not an expert i haven't got it all figured out even though i can say you've got a lot figured out already a lot of people <laughs> who are out there yeah yeah i think i think that might be your brand well you're welcome to come back whenever you have a new venture a coaching program let, let us know we're happy to get back i don't think we'll, we'll be able to get enough of you we managed to um unpack quite a few things but before um we go i don't know how much more time you have i've got a key question i want to ask you something i've grappled with how much has being a doctor hindered or helped you in this world of business because a lot of times even when i was in med school i used to show up and then you know i speak in business conferences and the interviews and all that and then people don't know i'm a student and then they don't know i'm a medical student they just knew my just 22 year old ceo and mm. i thought about it and I, I thought sometimes i felt like I didn't want to be. I didn't want it to be pronounced that I was a doctor because people tend to go, "Oh, yeah, doctor, just the doctor stuff." Mm. And sometimes it might also be helpful because people think, "Yeah, maybe it's got principles and all that." So, in your journey so far, how much has been a medical doctor, highly trained, if I might add? How much has that affected your journey? Well, th- th- that's a, an excellent question, and it's not a simple. Um, a simple binary answer so there's a couple of strands to that so the first strand is that it's hindered in quite a large extent because oh, doctors wow. are, are trained to be doctors it's a vocation um, you worry just as you said you don't know whether to tell them because you're worried about they, they may pigeonhole you and say stick to the doctoring stuff well other doctors do, other doctors are very blinkered. We we want to see patients. We don't like most GP partners don't. Yeah, most GP partners don't want to get involved in even the practice management or the finance side of running a practice. They just want to see their patients, and that's cool because it is a vocation, and a lot and that's absolutely admirable. But when you try and step away from that, there is a backlash within your circle of medics. You'd be amazed of the crabs in bucket mentality that you can encounter whereas if once somebody tries to escape the rest try and set traps for them or try and pull them back or you know belittle them or you know try and knock their confidence because they're daring to do something differently so in that respect the my perception of what other people would think really hindered me that was really significantly challenging at the start and tell patients and patients don't like it. They want, you are a doctor, how dare you? You know, the the, the society in this country expects doctors to sacrifice themselves at the altar of the NHS for the rest of their lives. Doesn't matter how bad the pay becomes, doesn't matter how overwhelming the workload is, you must see your patients and you must be happy about it because that's the vocation. So that part of it is very limiting. On the other side, 
okay. the ability to talk to people, the ability to think outside the box, the ability to understand people and empathize with people's situations because in properties and certainly in business when I'm looking to acquire something I'm not your typical retail buyer I'm not going out buying a property at full price I end up in situations where there's a, somebody that's had a health scare that needs to sell their house and I'm trying to understand their position so I can give them what works best for them if they may want too much for their property and I will agree to buy it for too much, but on my terms. And it, by understanding their situation, I may be able to say, well, I'll give you this now, and then in a year or so, when the, when I can increase the property's value, I'll give you the rest. So you win because you sell your property, I win because I buy your property, but the terms are favourable to both people. And it's the ability to do that is definitely helped by 20 years in the NHS because you can understand people and I see a lot of young people that fall off these property training courses, which I don't promote. If and I've, I've, I've seen enough of them over the years now, I don't promote them because they're, they're basically sales funnels to sell dreams. And you see these 17, 18, 19 year olds coming off and they, they just don't understand the way the world works. And it's quite cringy sometimes. Um, it's his screen all the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and and having 20 years in, in a patient-centered or a person-centered business does give you the skills that can allow you to become, to appear authentic, because you are, to have a higher ethical code than almost anybody else, because we're held to that, that standard by the GMC, and it gives you enough credibility to open some doors. So it does have pros and cons it, ha it has pros and cons that is a very realistic analysis and thank you so much for for bringing it down to you know the nitty-gritty um yeah before you go we're going to ask you to tell us how to find you what you do what you're what you're currently doing but before that i'm going to ask you of something i tend to ask for guests if you were to talk to let's say a younger andrew yeah. and then um, we're trying to look back pre 2011 yesterday before the gm to kiss and all that um what will be one single advice you're going to give a younger andrew let, let's say someone who is like 15 20 years younger what advice would you give to them don't don't get so, so much consumer debt mm -hmm. try and be more patient start reading some books um and consider carefully the amount of personal leverage that you're getting yourself into because that is another limiting factor in, in your growth when you actually start doing something. If you've got so much debt because you've got fully consumed up, then it's difficult. But yeah, basically get educated in learning about assets rather than liabilities and then just follow the path. That's excellent advice for anyone, not just younger Andrew. I think it's useful <laughs> for me right now. <laughs> That is excellent advice, really. So I'll, as I boiled it down to three. Um, manage your debt carefully. Don't get involved in too much consumer debt. Educate yourself in terms of your finances and try to learn stuff. And then um, I think the third one was also about managing your consumer debt. So basically, don't borrow too much money, more than you need. Uh, think of building assets and learn how to build assets. I think that is wonderful advice. Uh, part of the reason I was uh, able to quit my job two years ago um, and not work as a doctor and I'm not worried because I cleared every debt apart from mortgage-related debt. Um, obviously, that was positive debt. Uh, at that point, I think we're making a decision about my wife wanted to get a car and I thought, you know what, we're going to buy it cash and maybe it might even be bought through a limited company and all that because it was a business expense. And then um, we thought if we borrowed money, 10% was the current interest rate, which I thought was crazy. I mean, if you borrow money for 10%, how much is your investment returns? Mm. Um, so part of why I was able to make that decision and not be anxious was not having high consumer debt. So I, I would say amen to that, Andrew. And thank you so much for generously sharing so much wisdom and so much nuggets. I, I'm trying to think about what to frame in my thumbnail or the title of this 
podcast. I'm not I don't know from doctor to business buyer, from GP to business buyer, but there's so much in between. Don't worry, we'll see what we'll come up with. And um, tell us now, how, how can we find you? Because I'm sure many people want to find you. Obviously, one is LinkedIn. Tell us your website, your project. You've got a new newsletter as well, but not like mine. Mine is open to every doctor. Yours <laughs> is open to people who have actually invested in your business, which is one way to do it. Tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my investors, um, a- anybody can can join me and inquire about investing it doesn't matter you don't need to have lots of money for that but people can find me um i've got a website www.andrewthreadgold.com and that's a central repository for the other stuff that i do um if you i'd really appreciate a follow either on linkedin which is andrew threadgold or on instagram which is at corner plot properties um and yeah or my podcast the property doctor podcast it's very good it's not quite as good as this one though I think I love it. I think I love this. Yeah, I, there's going to be the links all in the show notes. So go go look at them and follow Andrew. I can tell you for free that Andrew is a fantastic um, person. He's enterprising. Um, there's one last question. It might not show up in the podcast if you don't like it. A name like Tread Gold. It's quite a name. I thought about that. I could steal that name. Tread Gold. What a name. It's not even a real name. It's such a... <laughs> Such a powerful name. When I think about it, I'm thinking about, yeah, Tread Gold. There's something golden about this guy. Oh, and bless that you. That name surely helps, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it's my real name. <laughs> It, uh, is it a real name? Okay, yeah. it's not a business brand name. No, unfortunately not. Although one of our friends is called Million. That's his surname, Million. Mi- million. But, uh, oh, what yeah. a name. Yeah. <laughs> Chad Gold will be apt if you're going into a fashion industry or you go gold or one of those. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's so lovely to, to speak with you. I'm sure I suspect we'll be having you back. Well, if you've been along with me, if you've joined me to listen to Andrew to get this masterclass, and how to go from a doctor to a real estate investor and a business buyer, and also the mentality around it. Well, I, w- I invite you to subscribe to the YouTube uh, channel if you haven't already subscribed. And if you want to get a weekly newsletter from me to tell you about interesting interviews like this, or to tell you about what's going on in the financial market, or how to optimize your pension or maximize your investment, or make sure you're not making costly mistakes that doctors make, Head over to moneywisedoctor.com and subscribe for free to the newsletter. And thank you for sticking around to the end. All right then. Bye-bye.